Can you see my mouse pointer? Yes. Okay. Um, so my, my topic is about evolutionary dynamics, and this is somehow similar to this self-organized criticality, or at least has some same ideas. And we heard about this Bach, Sneppen model, which is one of these like evolutionary models. I won't be talking about that model since we already heard about it. But uh, you can also think of it in this, this context. Um, so what we have here, so what, what I'm going to be presenting is that first I'm going to be talking about um, like uh, some, some kind of motivation, why we would want to look at evolutionary dynamics and then discuss some of the features that, that characterize evolution. And then we're going to look at uh, some models. First one is uh, the so-called replicator equation. And this is a very simple thing. Uh, we're not going to spend too much time on that. Then we're going to look at the Yang Krishna model more in depth. This is somehow a linear model. And there, uh, this is also a network model. So we can see, we will see how, how networks are related to this, this kind of evolutionary dynamics and, and the concept of fitness. And there's going to be some mathematics there. So, but not too much, so a little bit of linear algebra. People who have taken the combinatorial networks analysis course uh, probably feel at home here. Uh, then we have shortly the CCC model, which is the combinatorial co-evolutionary uh, critical model. Uh, this is a non-linear non model, and we're, we're not going to talk about this too much just shortly present the idea and some, some uh, results. And then I'm going to summarize the whole thing. So first of all, why should we try to make biology into somehow a mathematical science or have some kind of mathematical dynamics mixed with biology? Well, there's this nice quote from Theodosius Dobzhansky, who is uh, uh, geneticist and the quote reads nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution and I think this is a very powerful quote in the sense that uh, before we had evolution before uh, Darwin and all stuff biology was really a collection of, of different facts uh, about animal morphology and and uh, behavior of different kinds of organisms. And this evolution is really a, a unifying principle of all of biology. And whenever you look at biology, you have to keep in mind the, the, like the principle of evolution and also the evolution or history of the species you're looking at. So evolution is really, really, I think, the most critical cornerstone of, of biology. And in this sense, uh, biology is a pretty new science because the evolution, like the, the Darwin's, Darwin's works uh, were written in the 19th century, uh, long after people like Newton had made their, their like mathematical versions of physics, for example. So this is a, somehow a new science and also like the, uh, the units of hereditariness genes were only discovered in the 20th century, not that long ago. Like that, how, how uh, hereditariness is organized in, in the DNA. How, how does the DNA bring? What, what, is, the, what is the substance that uh, creates hereditariness? And that, that is DNA. And, and how does it do it? So in order to understand uh, biology, we need to understand evolution and to understand something, we kind of want to make, make a, a mathematical theory out of it. So we have this Darwinian description here. So of, of what evolution is, which reads that we have a population and 
we have individual elements inside that population. Population can be uh, one species or like combination of different species. And these uh, elements produce offspring, which is similar to them, but has some kind of variation. Some of these variations do well, and as a result, they reproduce more and they become more common in the population. This is something we call fitness. Some of them do badly and then they disappear. Uh, different environments can favor different variations. So this is, this is kind of uh, an explaining principle behind a lot of the diversity in life that we see, but this is not, this is a, a verbal description. It's not a mathematical theory. So in order to kind of truly understand what's going on and maybe even be able to make predictions, we need to make a mathematical theory of evolution. And that, that is what I'm trying to present here. So this evolutionary dynamics is a somehow an attempt to make the principle of evolution into mathematics or write it into mathematical language and make models that can be used to make predictions. And that's like, of course, important because then we can, we can falsify these theories and have, have some actual science, scientific understanding. So a general evolutionary algorithm, like if we try to make a somehow a mathematical theory, we can start from an algorithmic approach uh, and make this like Darwinian description into an, an algorithm that we can apply. Uh, so this is, this is uh, somehow a general attempt. So this would not only cover like biological evolution, but also stuff like uh, uh, economics and, and uh, other kinds of, kinds of evolution. So the algorithm is as follows. First, we create a new entity or a enti new entity is created. It's not necessarily created by, from an outside force, can be created from within the system. And then it's placed in an environment. And then the entity interacts with the environment and these interactions determine if the entity survives and proliferates, so produces offspring or dies out. And then if the entity survives, it becomes part of the environment. This is important. And it may introduce or change the interactions in the environment. And this can lead to cascading creation or extinction events like we, we saw in these uh, self-organized critical, critical models. We have these uh, cascades of, of new species creation or species going extinct. So an important part here is that entities and the environment are somehow coexisting. So they both affect each other. So it's not like we place um, entities in, an, in some kind of environment and then the environment stays static. No, it's the, like the interactions between the species and how they change the environment really shapes the, the process. So this is somehow difficult um, in, in mathematical terms, because this means that the boundary conditions of our equations are changing all the time, which makes it kind of difficult to solve, solve this kind of, uh, to, to see how the system would evolve. So there are some principles uh, related to this, this algorithm and in evolution in general. One of them is called combinatorial evolution. So that here in the first step, uh, we create a new entities. Uh, they can be created by consequence of already existing entities. So two entities, two or more entities produce a new kind of entity. For example, uh, we can have an existing species and then we have some radiation from outer space and this combined to create a mutation and a new species comes into into play so these entities don't have to be like species themselves we can for example mutations can be modeled this way that 
two things combine to make a third thing, a new thing that didn't exist before. Um, and then about the, uh, the uh, environment and the interactions uh, is the second point. So evolutionary systems exhibit this kind of co-evolutionary dynamics so that the states and the interactions, the states of the, of the entities or the species and the interactions between them, which is really the environment, they update each other. So like I said, boundary conditions are changing and uh, it, is kind of, it, it is very difficult to see where the balance will be or if there will be a balance because uh, this like the species going species uh, uh abundance is going towards a certain kind of equilibrium changes the environment which changes the place of the equi equilibrium so the system can be kind of constantly constantly evolving and a third point is that evolution is open-ended so there is no no preset goal there is no limit to how many species can be generated and we can, we have some periods of equilibrium, but they don't last forever. So if something happens, some perturbation happens, then we can generate more species and other species go extinct. Uh, and there is no, no target, so to speak. It is a thing that just happens. And what happens after an infinite time, for example, is, is very open-ended, so we cannot we cannot easily look at it that way that we can analyze the final state by looking at what happens at t equals infinity. So related to the, the trying to model this, this algorithm mathematically and all this uh, combinatorial evolution and co-evolution and open-endedness, it seems that it's very difficult to predict what will specifically happen, like which, which species will be the dominant one uh, when exactly is going there? Is there going to be a mass extinction? Uh, things like this, like accurately predicting future, is uh, very difficult, as we all know. So instead, in our models, we want to kind of predict statistical properties of evolution. So we want to take all these power laws that we see and then make models that also produce these power laws many cobblings between species or genes or whatever uh, are drawn randomly in, in these mathematical models. Ob obviously this is very different to reality, like what previously we had the buck Sneppen model where uh, uh, the, the fitness values would be just drawn randomly, which is not at all what happens in, in, in nature, but somehow if we just have enough entities, then, then we can uh, predict the statistical properties of the system correctly, even though the individual uh, couplings or interactions are, are just drawn randomly, which doesn't really make sense in the biological, biological sense. Uh, one important concept that relates to this uh, concept of evolution and and this like this idea that equilibria don't last forever so related to open-endedness is that we see punctuated equilibriums or equilibria uh, what what does this mean is that we have some kind of burstiness so again we can talk about criticality that uh these kind of periods of mass creation of new species and mass destruction of existing species occur in, in some kind of bursts. But most of the time, the system is in some kind of temporary equilibrium. And then this, these equilibria are punctuated by these massive events. And the transitions between two equilibria can cause or will cause large diversity changes. So diversity is like how many different kinds of species, how many different kinds of uh, super classes of species there are in, in, a, in a system. And if we see this kind of dynamics that we have periods of 
of equilibria punctuated by these transi transition periods, then we can see these fat tail distributions, which include power loss, like uh, for example, in the size of the diversity changes, they should be somehow uh, distributed according to a power law. Creation and extinction rates are also power law-like and lifetimes of entities are also power law-like. Like we also saw in the bugs Neffen model, we can see uh, somehow pow power loss in this uh, extinction rates. So basically we, we want to, in our models, we need to have this idea of punctuated equilibrium equilibria somewhere in there so that we can produce all these nice power laws. And th this is an idealized picture. Uh, and if you look at the evolutionary history of life, then here we have like the number of genera or like the singularized genus. So that, that's a super group of, of uh, different species. And here we have a, a time scale of, of, uh, of hundreds of millions of years. And maybe 500, 500 million years, we see this uh, so-called Cambrian explosion. So before this, uh, the diversity of life was very low or kind of low. And then something happened and there was a sudden increase. And then there have been this uh, a lot of uh, mass extinctions, the largest five are called the big five. So we have the, like the five large uh, mass extinction in, in the history of life. I think this one is the one that destroyed the dinosaurs. So we have this, uh, we can kind of see the same. So we have this diversity transition and then or equilibrium uh, transition and equilibrium. Of course, here the equilibria are somehow debatable, but we have to keep in mind the the time scale. So, uh, for example, this this uh, Cambrian explosion took tens of millions of years. So, if we look at the the vicinity of these, then we can somehow somehow maybe see this uh, semi equilibrium state punctuated by massive massive extinction. Right. So this is this is uh, this kind of uh, behavior, this algorithm and all these uh, these features we want to model model in our in our uh, uh, evolutionary dynamic systems. So we start with a pretty simple simple thing called the replicator equation where xi is now the relative abundance of species i. This can be uh, like a biological species or chemical species or, or whatever that evolution is acting on. And the rate of change of the relative abundance, so relative abundance means that it's between zero and one and all the abundances in a system sum to one. Then the rate of change for this is uh, proportional to uh, the abundance itself times the difference between the fitness of the entity and the weighted population average fitness. So fi is now some fitness function. Uh, X is the vector which includes all the all the relative abundances of all the species in the in the system. So this fitness can depend not only on the species itself, but on all the other species as well. And then this is just the weighted, weighted average of all the, all the fitnesses. So this kind of, kind of tells that if um, your fitness is better than average, then uh, this will be positive. You will uh, increase your relative abundance. If it's below that, then you will decrease the relative abundance. And as the dynamics plays out, these fitness values change also as a function of time because X is now implicitly a function of time. 
Uh, an example of this, this kind of equation is the Lotka Volterra system. Um, this is now the unnormalized version, so the, the frequencies are not between 0 and 1. We have uh, one species, which is the prey, another species, which is the predator. And the fitness functions look something like this, so that if the predator population increases, then the prey fitness goes down. And if the prey population increases, then the predator fitness goes up. So uh, the predator eats the prey, and the prey just uh, sustains itself from an ample supply of, of energy. And this is a static fitness landscape. So there is a, a limit cycle attractor in the system. So the system will look like this. If we, if we solve these differential equations, then first the prey population will go up, then the predator population will follow that with a slight lag, which means that the prey population will go down, which means that the predator population will then go down with, with some lag and so on. So there is a forever oscillating pattern in, in this system. And this is now not really what we wanted because um, there is no punctuated equilibria. There is no uh, power loss, no mass, mass extinct. Of course, we only have two species. So we don't have any extinction events or creation events or anything. So maybe this, this kind of approach is not, not uh, very realistic. We have to think of something else. And what, what would be important is that we have a separation of time scales. So we would have some kind of uh, ecological dynamics in a short time scale, and then these evolutionary dynamics with, with uh, these punctuations. So mass increases or decreases in diversity in the long time scale. And next, we're going to look at the. Uh, no, okay. <laughs> so we would we would need to have this this kind of uh, uh, double double time scale system to uh, to be able to model these punctuated equilibrium dynamics. So there there are some issues with this this uh, replicator equation and lot of other approaches. Is that the set of species is fixed, so the evolution is not open ended. We cannot. Uh, create an arbitrary number of new species. And like, we, like I said, it doesn't have the punctuated equilibrium dynamics. Um, and if we have a lot of different species, then this will be a very high dimensional system. So that small variations in the initial conditions lead to completely different trajectories. So it's very, very hard to predict anything with this kind of, kind of uh, system. To fix some of these problems, we look at the uh, Jain Krishna model, uh, which has somehow a similar form to the replicator equation, but now we in, in the short time scale. We have another, like we have a, an algorithm on the longer time scale also, and this I will describe later, but first we look at the, the, the short time scale or the ecological dynamics. So, the time scale is so short that the environment doesn't have like time to change. So somehow we have an idea that the, it takes more time for the environment to change than for the for the species to find some kind of an ecological balance. For example, between how how much uh, predator species there is and how much prey species there is. So now our equation reads like this: the rate of change for species i relative abundance is a sum of some kind of influence of all the species minus some kind of normalization factor. And what this mij now is, is an adjacency matrix of a directed erdos renu network. So it's a random, random network mm -hmm. where an edge exists with weight one with probability p if i is not equal to j uh, and with probability one minus p it doesn't exist and there are no self loops. 
So this means that species can help other species uh, proliferate. And it's, the interaction is always constructive because this is always, if there's an edge, it's the weight is equal to one and always has the same, same intensity. And this phi is now some kind of dilution flux. So this, uh, this equation comes from uh, chemistry. So there, this, uh, we, we will see what, what is the interpretation of, of this equation, but now this is somehow dilution flux, or we can call it somehow normalization, normalization factor. So we have this Mij randomly, randomly coupled. And here, of course, we go over all the species in the system. And since Mii is always zero, then this is the sum of the influences of all the other species on species i. So what does this Mij or the random network represent? So like I said, this, this is inspired from, this equation is inspired from chemistry. And there we can find an interpretation. So Mij encodes the rate at which species I is produced by a reaction that is catalyzed by species J. So species J is not, uh, not a substance that would be producing I, but it, it is a catalyst for the production of I. And in our network, of reactions. So if this is uh, one, then, uh, then I is produced by a reaction that is catalyzed by J. And if it's zero, then it's not produced by that. So when we draw the network, it's really an, like an interaction or catalysis network. And I itself then in turn may be a catalyst for another reaction. And now, what are these species A and B here? So these are somehow buffered. So <laughs> there's plenty of material for reaction in, in, in biological sense. This would mean that uh, new species or, or like if we have an amount of some species and then this amount increases, where does the increase come from? Somehow from the, there is, there is somehow an ample supply of energy or food or, or whatever. So that uh, if the interactions of other species allow a species to proliferate, it will. So that it's, it's not limited by environmental factors. So these A and B are now not really meaningful in, in our, uh, our equation or our like biological approach. It's just like there is, when, when uh, two individuals produce an offspring, the mass of the offspring ha has to come from somewhere and there is enough food for the parents to eat that they can produce this offspring. That's basically this, what, it, what this means. Uh, but the, the important thing is that it's a catalyzed reaction. So if there is no catalyst, then this reaction doesn't happen or happens extremely slowly. So but basically, we need this, this catalyst in order to produce I. And of course, all the influences, there, there, there are many, many reactions and their total influence uh, affects the rate of, rate of uh, creation of species I. An example of this is that a biological species may help another species proliferate. So for example, we have bees and flowers, so bees uh, help the flowers pollinate, which increases the proliferation rate of the flowers, and the flowers give nectar to the bees, which increases the proliferation of, of the bees. So there is some kind of uh, beneficial interaction going on. So now we want to solve, we have this equation and an interpretation, and we want to solve it. It's a linear, uh, it's a set of linear differential equations. The solution looks something like this. So X is now a vector of all the, all the state, states of all the species in the system. And uh, it, it, like X as a function of T has this form. So this is a matrix 
uh, uh, exponential, which is defined like this. So M is now a matrix. So E to the power of the matrix is this infinite series here. So, and, and this is probably familiar to people from the combinatorial networks analysis course. Now, now we want to somehow make, make inferences at, at xt. So we will look at the, the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of m. So let vi and lambda i be the eigenvectors and eigenvalues of m, of which there are n, because n is the number of, of species. So we can write the initial condition as linear combination of these eigenvectors like this. So there is some kind of uh, factor and then each of the eigenvectors and we, we take the sum over, over all the, uh, the dimensionality of, of M. So when we plug this into this equation, we get this. So X as a function of time looks something like this. And then from, from linear algebra, we know that uh, if u is an eigenvector with eigenvalue a of x, then e to the power of x times u is e to the power of a times u, which implies that for us, this e to the power of mt times the nth uh, eigenvector is equal to this. Uh, because now lambda m is an eigenvalue of m, and if we m, uh, uh, multiply m by t, then all the eigenvalues are also multiplied by t. So lambda m times t is an eigenvalue of mt if lambda m is an eigenvalue of m. So we can replace this, this uh, inconvenient infinite sum in our equation or in our solution to the equation uh, by this. So x's function of time looks something like this. And this is really nice because now we can apply the peron frobenius theorem uh, because m is m only has ones and zeros this positive semi definite and from the peron frobenius theorem we know that this for this kind of matrix uh, the largest eigenvalue largest in modulus because the eigenvalues can also be complex numbers so the largest eigen in modulus eigenvalue lambda 1 is real and what's better is that the entries in V1, which is the eigenvector corresponding to lambda 1, all of them are real and greater than or equal to zero. And when T goes to infinity here, so we, we look at our ecological dynamics. So uh, we find some kind of balance, uh, like an ecological balance. Uh, when the environment is not changing. So this is the fast time scale. So like T goes to infinity in the fast time scale, which means that we reach uh, this uh, equilibrium between these punctuation events. Then we know that lambda one is the largest eigenvalue. So in this sum, it will dominate the others when T goes to infinity. And now this is somehow not a normalized. So we need to, uh, at each time point, we need to normalize the vector by the sum, sum of the vector. So uh, gradually, this, this term will dominate all the others. And at, at the limit of t goes to infinity, xt will look like v1. Uh, because it's like it, it grows the fastest, so it will like dominate, dominate all the all the others, uh, other terms in this sum. Uh, this, is, this is pretty great because now we have some kind of balanced state and, and we know that all the entries in V1 are real and greater than or equal to zero. So the end state, this eigenvector, uh, this is also the vector of the eigenvector centralities of the network represented by M. Uh, what is like, why, why this term for Benius theorem is great? Because that we know that all of these are greater than or equal to zero. So 
we don't have any weird stuff like uh, species abundance going into the negative or, or something like this. So we can be confident that this, this uh, end state is actually like makes sense in, in, in some, some, some way. So to find the end state of the, of the short time scale model or the find how the, the uh, differential equation behaves, we just need to look at the eigenvector centralities of the network represented by M, uh, which is pretty cool. So uh, we can somehow easily easily calculate in the short short time scale what happens. But this this system does not have any punctuated equilibria, and it's just like. Uh, uh, finds an equilibrium at t equals infinity. So in order to have this punctuated equilibria, we need to have the longer time scale or the environment needs to change. In this previous uh, equation, the vector n, which is the environment, the, the vector of interactions or the, the matrix of interactions, it doesn't change. So in the longer time scale, we need to change this. So, the, so we have this like co-evolutionary dynamics that we talked about before. And between these, these environmental change uh, events, we assume that this ecological balance state is, is reached. So the, uh, the Jain Krishna model algorithm reads like this. So at time capital T, we solve the ecological balance uh, X star, which is the Peron Frobenius eigenvector. And then we find the least abundant species S, so with the species with the smallest value in this uh, ecological balance vector. And we remove that by setting all its interactions to zero. And then in its place, we introduce a new species with random interactions again. So for each, each uh, uh, point in this, this uh, column and row, we set it to one with probability P, uh, excluding of course the, the diagonal element, which we keep zero at all times. And then we increase the, the long time scale T by one and then go back to, back to one. So this model is, is co-evolutionary. So the interactions of species change with the species abundance X. And now we have our first real explanation of fitness. So previously fitness was defined as somehow the proliferation rate, which is maybe a cyclical definition because uh, by definition, species with high fitness proliferate more. And then if we define fitness as the proliferation rate, then this is somehow a cyclical or tautological definition which doesn't really explain what fitness is. So now we have an explanation of what fitness is. It's related to the, or it's the, the Peron Frobenius eigenvector. And this is an emergent property of the interaction network. So the structure of the interaction network is really what gives rise to this fitness. And this is a different definition from defining it as the proliferation rate, because now we can uh, kind of make make some inferences with it. So now fitness is is an emergent property of the system, which which is uh, has more explaining power. So what happens in this model is something like this. So dt is now the diversity of the system. So the number of species with non-zero entries in X, so that the number of species that actually exist in the system, which have a relative abundance greater than zero. So of course, we are limited by the number of N. So before, before running the, the model, we need to decide the number of species N, and we are limited by that. So what happens is that first, the diversity is pretty low. And then it increases and decreases, increases, decreases. And then there are these massive collapses and large increases. So 
this somehow looks like that punctuated equilibrium uh, that we had before. And that's great news because now we have, we have in that short time scale, we have the balanced dynamics and in the long time scale, we have this punctuated equilibrium. And for a more concrete thing, uh, I can show you, th there's a link. Can you see this? Yes. You, you can see the web page? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So first off, we want to increase this rate here. Uh, so we, we initialize the network uh, with random interactions. So this is the average in degree, average out degree in the network. And then we run this algorithm uh, where we identify the least fit species, remove it, and then replace it with uh, a new species with random interactions. And what happens to the parent Frobenius eigenvalue is that, well, it increases. And here we can see the eigenvector, which is the, the ecolo ecological balance of so the relative abundances of the different, different species. So we can see that this changes as the interaction network itself changes. And there are some extinctions and change the, the parameters. And uh, one of the exercises that you have to run this and, and try out different, different parameters and see what happens. I'm hoping we could see a, an extinction event, this kind of, uh, random, so, so maybe we won't. But at the extinction event, somehow this eigenvalue goes to uh, zero or decreases significantly and a lot of species die out at the same time. For example, here we can see a lot of species just died out and then we are back in the, in the equilibrium after a short while. Yeah, now you can see the slideshow again, I guess. So what explains this, this uh, behavior where we have periods of, of uh, diversity and then these sudden massive collapses and then on the other hand, these massive increases in diversity? Well, we have to look at something called autocatalytic sets and autocatalytic cycles. So if in the interaction network we have a directed cycle, this is called an autocatalytic cycle because this somehow can sustain itself because uh, all the, the, the species produce the catalysts that are needed in the production of the other species. Uh, so there is a, like a cyclical production going on and, and this can like, keep increasing the abundances of these species. So if we have a strongly connected component in the network, then the species are in one or more autocatalytic cycles because from each, each node or each species, you can go to all the other species, which means that there is some kind of cycle going on. And an autocatalytic set is defined as the species in a strongly connected component. So this cycle, uh, plus the species in an out component. So here we can see, here we have a cycle which can sustain itself. So all the, this uh, catalysts, uh, these species are catalysts for the production of all the other species. And then we have also this extra uh, species here, which is somehow as a byproduct of this cycle running, this is also produced. So this is in total, this is an auto catalytic set which is defined by that each member in an autocatalytic set is the product of another catalyst in the set. And this, the presence of these autocatalytic cycles is related to the peron frobenius eigenvalue of the network. So if there is no autocatalytic cycle, then the eigenvalue is zero. If there is at least one cycle, then the eigenvalue is greater than or equal to one. 
and how do these autocatalytic cycles explain diversity? So first, when we initialize the model with a random network, then probably we don't have any cycles. And if we, in the presence of no cycles, the species concentrations flow to the furthest leaf node. And by this, I mean the leaf node. So if there are no cycles, then the graph is a tree or a forest. Um, so the concentrations, you can, you can imagine a cascade of, of uh, reactions. And we have species one is the catalyst for the production of species two. So this concentration of species one stays the same, but the concentration of species two increases. And the species two is a catalyst for species three, which means that as uh, the, uh, the concentration of species two increases, the concentration of species three increases even faster. So in the end state, uh, all that remains is the, all, what, the, the leaves that are part of the longest uh, path in the network or longest paths in the network. So for example, we have a path of length six, then uh, these, these dominate somehow the other species. There can be one or more of these, these furthest leaf nodes. And if there is at least one cycle in the network, then this can somehow sustain itself and outproduce all the other, other things because this is somehow a positive feedback loop. So when we look at the relative abundance, again, we look at the relative abundances at time t equals infinity. So only the species that can produce the fastest will exist at that point. So they will dominate all the others because of this relative abundance scaling. So if there is at least one cycle in the network, then only species that are part of of that or the dominant autocatalytic set, which is uh, like a self-producing structure, only those survive. So the diversity of the network is equal to the size of the dominant autocatalytic set if it exists. So how, how does this explain the emergence of diversity? Well, first, when we initialize the network, we make it sparse so that it has no cycles. Uh, the interactions are somehow random and then when removing and adding new nodes, then at some point there will appear the first autocatalytic cycle and its autocatalytic set will dominate all the others. This means that when we look at the, the ecological balance vector, then all the, all the other species that are not part of the autocatalytic set, their relative abundances will be zero. So the species that will be removed next is one of these species and not one of them one of the species in the auto catalytic set, which means that we remove this and then by chance when we add replace them with new new uh, species, then sometimes uh, these species join the auto catalytic set. So basically when we run as, as we run the simulation, then more and more species will join this dominant auto catalytic set. Uh, until the point where all the species in the system are in the set. So before that, we have like one, one species that is not in the set uh, and its uh, relative abundance is zero. So we remove that and add a new one. And then if that new species is added to the autocatalytic or connected to the autocatalytic set, then all the species are in the set and there are no species with relative abundance zero anymore. So we have to remove one of the species in the autocatalytic set. And one of the species might be a species that participates in the autocatalytic cycle that upholds this set. So if we remove one of these uh, species that, that is crucial in the, in the cycle. For example, here we have the cycle and the set. If you remove this species, then there will be no cycle. And again, we're back to this scenario where there are no cycles and only the diversity is equal to the number of the furthest leaf nodes. So this will somehow be a catastrophic collapse. So breaking, breaking this autocatalytic cycle will cause a mass extinction 
unless there are other autocatalytic sets also, in which case it might just decrease uh, the diversity by, by a little or a lot. So there is like different magnitudes of, of catastrophes or uh, mass extinctions. And of course, we can also by chance create another autocatalytic set. Uh, and the size of the set determines, or the size of the cycle determines if it uh, will outproduce the other cycle. So there only one autocatalytic set dominates at a time. So this might decrease the diversity, even though we are not at the maximum diversity. So here we can see. Here we go to the maximum diversity, and here we have a small and a large collapse. But here we don't reach the maximum maximum diversity yet, and yet there is a collapse. So this means that another autocatalytic set has formed that has has become the dominant set. This means that the diversity is not non-decreasing, uh, and we have this punctuated equilibrium dynamics with diversification events, which is when you grow the autocatalytic set, we have these balance periods uh, where the autocatalytic set size becomes uh, maximum. And then we have these extinction events where an autocatalytic set is broken and suddenly there is a massive, massive loss of, of diversity. So the structure of the environment or the interaction network somehow uh, creates this uh, punctuated equilibrium dynamics in the model. And the model also works with if, so now previously we set all this Mij to exactly one and Mii exactly zero so that we could apply the pattern Frobenius theorem in solving solving the uh, differential equations or the short time scale behavior. But we can also use uh, uh, like weights between minus one and one so that not all the influences are positive. So previously all the influences were positive, but now we can also have negative influence, which means for example, competition between two species. And there can be somehow a uh, self suppression, but no, no like, self autocatalysis because this would lead to like autocatalytic uh, loops of size one or one node uh, and that's not really what we want so we want to have this these like self loops between minus one and zero and in this weighted weighted version interestingly we see that uh, this like positive links have some selection bias because if you have a lot of positive links, then you're more likely to be in the autocatalytic set. So this diversity explosion, we can see here, uh, we have an equilibrium and then we have this uh, diversity explosion and then we have another equilibrium. And at this uh, explosion, the number of positive links increases sharply also. So the way that version also ex, uh, explains somehow how cooperation or mutualism between species comes from this uh, process of, of eliminating uh, the weakest node in the interaction network. So now we have a, a system that explains fitness as an emergent property of the interaction network and also exhibits this uh, punctuated equilibrium dynamics. There are also downsides or, or like issues with this, namely that this model is not open-ended. So we cannot, first we have to decide on the number of species beforehand, and there are no uh, new species created from comb combining existing uh, species or, or uh, things. So there is, we have co-evolutionary dynamics because the environment and the uh, species kind of uh, evolve with each other. We have punctuated equilibrium, equilibria. We have a, a good fitness definition, but we don't have open-endedness and we don't have combinatory evolution. 
So I'm going to uh, briefly go over this other model called co-evolving combinatorial critical model, which supposedly has this uh, open-endedness. Mm, and combi uh, as the name implies, it also has combina combinatorial interactions. So as the Jan Krishna model, it was linear. So there was no like combinatorial effects. This one is, is nonlinear. So here you can see the equation and here we have multiplied these two things. So this, this uh, here implies nonlinearity. So what we have instead of relative abundances, we have the states of the entities. So this is either zero or one. So this is different from in the Jan Krishna model, we had nice uh, like relative abundances. We could see, see uh, differences in which species are more successful and which species are less successful. But here we don't have that. We just have if the species exists or not. Uh, and the algorithm is as follows. So at time t, we pick an entity i at random, and then we compute the fitness of i. Uh, which is a double sum over j and k. And we have this uh, tensor element minus another tensor element multiplied by if this species exists or not. So this, this will only participate in the sum if both of these are one. So both of the species exist. So you can imagine this is the combinatorial part. So you have two species. And if both of them exist, then they can produce a third species. And then the next state of i is set according to this, this uh, rule. So if the fitness is greater than zero, then the species becomes or comes into existence or continues existence. If this fitness is less than zero, then it disappears. And if it's exactly equal to zero, then it uh, keeps the old state. And then we have some randomness here also. So with probability p, we switch the state. So the state at the next time step, we switch. If it's one, it's zero. If it's zero, it's one. Uh, so we do the switch with probability p. Then we continue until all the entities have been updated once. And then we go to the next, next time step. And what are these tensors m plus and m minus? Well, they're called production and destruction tables. And they, describes, they describe the rules of, of combinatorial interactions. So how entities can be combined to produce other entities, or how entities can be combined to destroy other entities. So as, as we have previously seen, we can use some kind of uh, random model for this to see the statistical properties of evolution. So, we use random tensors with uh, the average number of productive or destructive sets per entity given by R plus and R minus. So if we run this simulation with, with some, some parameters, then we see this. So black means that the entity exists, and white means the entity doesn't exist. Here's the number. We have 100 entities in total. And here we can also see punctuated equilibrium dynamics. So we have somehow uh, balanced equilibrium states, which are punctuated by periods of uh, weird stuff happening, periods of like unrest. So there's, there's some kind of uh, shuffling or, or, or some kind of noise uh, or some kind of cascading behavior going on here. And then it goes into a new, new equilibrium. And the choice of R minus and R plus, this is somehow robust. So here we see the number of transitions between uh, 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 states in the simulation period. Then there are these somehow large areas where for R plus and R minus, where we can see this equilibrium dynamics. So it's not, not really that we have to like fine tune the model to get this, this behavior. So th this model, exhibits punctuated equilibrium, like we said, and then self-organized criticality. So we have, we are somehow between, uh, or in the, in the critical region when we have this punctuated equilibrium dynamics. 
and also had this autocatalytic cycles. Now they are called production cycles uh, because it's basically two species or like species producing another species with states zero and one. And now here in the simulation, we have a fixed number of entities, but how, how can we make this into uh, an open-ended model? Well, we can think of these interaction tables, these tensors, as somehow underlying rules of nature. So for, for example, you can combine hydrogen and oxygen to, be, to create water. This is a, a rule of rule of nature, rule of physics, and even though, like our understand, we have understood this thing as a species for not that long, but the rule has always existed. It has always been there. So we have this like underlying rules of nature, but the system moves through the possibilities offered by these rules of nature or these combinatory rules. Which means that even because we have this combinatory uh, interaction here, then even if species I didn't exist or like was not included in the model at all, so it didn't have a state basically, it can be produced if J and K, if there's a rule that says that J and K produce species I, it can be produced even though it was not in the model uh, previously. So if we have infinite sized rule tables, then we can have an open-ended model. Uh, so of course, at any given time, we only have a finite set of species in existing in the model, but they can produce any number of new species uh, defined by this production table. So it's the population somehow, we have an infinite size tensor and then the population somehow moves, moves through this tensor and uh, creates new species and all species are destroyed. Because in the, in the calculation of the fitness function, we, only the currently existing species are summed over. So for all the species that don't exist, uh, this is zero. So we can just leave them out of the sum. So this can be a sum from not to n, but to infinity. Uh, but still the number of things that we need to sum is finite if the number of species is finite. Uh, but they can produce any number of new species. We just have to check all the corresponding entries in the rule tables and the new species will be produced. So this model somehow also brings open-endedness into, into this evolutionary dynamics. And the open-endedness is specifically a result of this uh, combinatorial interactions, which were not present in the Jain Krishna model. So in summary, uh, we have in, in evolutionary systems, we have punctuated equilibria we have open-endedness through combinatorial interactions. So existing entities can produce completely new entities and there is no, no goal to this. They can be like produced, uh, you can produce any number of new, new species. And another, uh, the third important feature is that the species and the fitness landscape or the environment uh, co-evolve. So both of them affect each other so that boundary conditions change all the time as the composition of the species in the system changes. And the Jain Krishna model uh, creates and explains this punctuated equilibria by the formation and destruction of these autocatalytic sets or autocatalytic cycles by a co-evolution of species and interactions. So uh, the species and interactions co-evolve and because of this uh, the fitness landscape or the environment can change and punctuate the equilibrium and in this model fitness is described as an emergent interaction network property instead of 
a tautological definition that uh, a high fitness leads a high high fitness uh, leads to a high proliferation rate, and high proliferation rate leads to high fitness. So now fitness is somehow somehow tells us something about the system. And the triple C model also adds open endedness through infinitely large production and destruction tables through which the finite set of, set of species moves in time. Well, this requires that we have an infinite set of uh, underlying uh, rules of nature. And uh, most of the pictures are from these sources and uh, the theory of complex systems chapter five is a good overview and then these two papers by Jain and Krishna describe the uh, unweighted and the weighted versions of the of the model respectively. Okay, uh, are there any questions?